Thank you very much for joining us. We're going to talk a bit about data today, uh, as I'm sure you all guessed. And again, I think most of you have worked out that we can uh, comment in the webinar and AMA discussion channel. Um, if you have any specific questions, please feel free to use that. Uh, in particular, because I know that everyone's going to have different levels of understanding of data and experience with data. I've tried to make it so I can deal with it at every level. And so we'll try to make sure that we can work through any more detailed questions as they come up. Uh, I've got you for an hour or so. And obviously, please feel free to you know, ask questions. I'll happily carry on uh, answering questions as they go. But I want to try and make sure that we leave you all feeling like you have a better understanding about how to use data. In particular, I'm a bit of a data philic. I love data and I came, became... Uh, someone who loved data in a similar way to uh, maybe you were saying about being an interest in amateur. That's kind of how I started, except I got the advantage of being in telco companies where I specifically um, was sort of required to understand how data worked back in the early noughties. Um, so from 2002 to 2006, we were running a mobile Java games platform and we had to use telco type discipline to understand you know, our targeting, our structuring, our audience, etc., etc. So it's a fantastic learning space for me to really understand it uh, and, you know, understand how to use data. But obviously, m things have moved on. Let me give you all a little bit of a sense of, um, if you don't already know who I am, um, but let me try and give you a sense of who I am. And I will uh, just spread the little corner here. So um, obviously, I'm Oscar. I have been around the games industry since 1998. And uh, the oldest among you may remember that particular Wireplay logo if you were in the UK and you had a dial-up modem in that era. Wireplay was um, technically the second online gaming service in the world by about two weeks. And I joined about maybe two years after it was launched and ended up um, managing uh, that whole platform. In fact, designing the third uh, client for that uh, particular um, service. I was also at three, a mobile operator for Java games. We were the most successful in the world in terms of revenue per user. And I was delighted to be part of the uh, original Metaverse era where I was home architect on PlayStation's virtual world, PlayStation Home. And uh, some of you may know me from my time at uh, Unity as an evangelist, particularly on the ads. And I did a lot of talk about analytics at the time as well. And I'm also a consulting editor, uh, sorry, contributing editor, sorry, for uh, PocketGamer.biz. Um, um, would you believe I even spent some time at NVIDIA? Um, go green team, if you know what I mean. Um, Fundamentally Games is our publishing. Uh, we are a live ops publishing company. We think that tr training people on best practices in terms of use of data and use of live ops uh, experiences, basically around pr creating better games for players, because at the end of the day, we believe that you know creating live service experiences can make better games for players. Um, and of course, I was also uh, the author of the book Games as a Service, which is coming up to 10 years since I wrote that. So I need to update that dramatically. Anyway, so that is me. If anyone has any questions on about my background, etc., etc., um, please feel free to ask. OK, let us go into the next stage. So why is data important? Important things about data we can learn is do players care about our game? I mean, I mean, it's all very well that we love our game, but do players, you know, what are our revenues? Um, you know, what um, are we are we retaining players? Are players converting to watching ads if you have a mobile game and you're using ad systems or if you have a, a PC game and you've got in world ads? How is that affecting play? Um, are they spending? Are they upgrading to vip packages battle passes you name it has the name battle pass suddenly become scary and, and intimidating to players um even though it's supposed to be the best experience for uh, it, sh it can create some of the best experiences for players where are we losing players why are we losing players um is that level too easy is it too hard um, i mean you can read the, re the rest of the lines the key thing is there's a whole bunch of information which we can't make our games work well unless we understand what's going on. And it's all very well having our own opinions, but opinions don't count. What counts is what is going on. Um, and I like to quote Mythbusters on this. Basically, the only difference between uh, screwing around and science is writing things down. For me, the data is how we write things down. So what 
analysis delivers what piece of information. So, I mean, this is just, like I say, this is just a cursory glance just to give you a sense of the different types of data that we need to think about. So, for example, you know, what do players care about the game? Well, we need to know about retention. We probably can gain a lot of insight from social metrics. We can also get some insight in terms of sentiment analysis, whether that's sentiment analysis inside the game or inside the social platform. Now, sentiment analysis, we'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, there's some interesting conflicts uh, of how we use language, which can, which can make that very difficult. What are the revenues? Well, we can have revenue reports, but what we don't know is what good looks like. Now, we can use some external market data. And I've not covered the market data in this because I've covered it in the past when I was looking at how you um, forecast games. But I think it's worth bearing in mind, you know, how, how do we know what good looks like, uh, particularly when it comes to revenue? Uh, moving swiftly on on that, you know, are we retaining players? Yes, we can look at re retention data. Well, retention data, that can be gained in a number of ways. But typically, we're talking about gameplay uh, behavioural information in some form lifestyle analytics sorry life cycle analytics now uh, not enough people particularly with live ops games look at the life cycle of a player but it's something that actually affects us whether we're making hyper casual or if we're making the longest long-term mmo if you don't understand the period that someone comes and finds your game installs your game plays your game deletes your game if you don't understand that cycle you're not going to be able to improve it you're not going to be able to understand what kind of monetization is going to work. You're not going to understand if your game is any good or not. And actually, the more we look at this, the more we know that retention in particular, the long term engagement with your game is the single biggest factor to profitability. Uh, and you only get what you measure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so we need to measure these things and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like and some ways of encouraging how we get the best data without causing issues with privacy. Uh, net Promoter Score. Anyone heard of Net Promoter Score before? You can use them. I think you can use emotes um, if you wish to. Um, it'd be good to see if you've got any thumbs up or thumbs down on that. Um, but um, Net Promoter Score is a really important factor in the world of generic marketing, not just in games. It's something that's become something interesting for games as well. It's where we get qualitative research so basically it's like a focus group and we see what real players actually do and then when we know what real players actually do we can then make corrective uh, action now the difference is that when you ask someone in a survey you'll get their opinion when you look at the gameplay data you see what they actually do and they almost never match up and one of the skills of data analytics and making the data count is being able to interpret the difference. So we use tools like uh, Playtest Cloud and Antidote to be able to do that. We'll, again, we'll go into that a bit later. But the key thing is understanding that different forms of analytics, different forms of processing, different forms of data capture, different forms of review have different results. And they allow us to get a better understanding of what's going on in the game. And at the end of the day how we can be better at making the game for the player so with that in mind let us look at some of the pieces of data the attribution data i'm not sure how many of you have looked at this i started with this because it's not always the first thing that comes to mind but it is the first point of information that we have about the player attribution data can be um through any number of sources here are three we've got kachava and apps flyer which are mobile centric experiences but then a steam data suite steam data suite is specifically for steam uh, for those of you who try to use the um, umt uh, system that steam provides you will know that it is somewhat challenging let's say that um, i i have found it less valuable than not having it uh, historically I, I know they've made some improvements lately so i haven't checked but my understanding is it still hasn't solved the fundamental problem platforms like steam data suite um use the, you know, the the tracking id to be able to understand what's going on and then because they are a, a member of your account they can then uh, track back the rest of the data so it means that now we can actually use some of the techniques to understand what players do and how we find them 
that we've been using in mobile for the best part of 10 years. So we, I think we're in a, in a, a moment with understanding how we find data, what people are interested in, uh, in PC in a really interesting way. Something that's really important to the way we work. It does require some level of social platform integration. For example, if you're going to use Meta, um, you have to set up a Facebook app to be able to trigger, for mobile this is, trigger a, a recognized install. We don't quite have that option when it comes to um, PC games. They don't really work in the same way. But again, understanding how you get the, the uh, feedback to the platform that you're providing the links on the pushes and the paid acquisition to really can help you understand how to better target, who's actually linking, the propensity of people with certain demographics to come into the game and be effective consumers of the game, you know, how long they retain and so on and so forth. But also some other fundamental stuff if you're using particularly a mobile, uh, is how we learn to optimize, how, how the platforms learn to optimize their performance as well. So it, it's a really important thing to think about. So attribution, basically let us understand a little bit more about the players um, that we acquire before we acquire them and where we acquire them from. So if we're doing a social uh, event, if we go to PAX, we can see how effective that activity was not only on our on our game uh, performance but potentially also on our sentiment analysis and things like that social metrics let's talk about social metrics lots of different ways of pulling that together so we're looking at how we can track engagements reach uh, click-through rates things like that um it's really important to understand what's happening particularly uh, we'll talk about rate of change a lot later it does obviously require some sort of platform. We tend to use tools like uh, Agora Pulse. That's our particular preference. Uh, Sprout Social. We did try Hootsuite. It's not as sophisticated, uh, but it's a relatively cheap option uh, if you need something uh, to manage and collaborate your thing. Now, the data itself, you can actually get directly through sources, uh, but accessing that in a way that's nice and clean is a little bit more complicated if you go manually. But I want to know, you know, what, you know, who's following, where they're coming from, what's exciting them, what messages and, and, and languages and images and videos are triggering the most interactions. And I want to track that over time, uh, particularly, you know, there's a principle of growth hacking, particularly if we're trying to get, you know, significant or organic acquisition of users. It's really important to understand, frankly, what do they care about? You know, we talk a lot about growth hacking and we talk a lot about these sort of clinical terms like paid acquisition, organic acquisition. At the end of the day, it comes down to players who are passionate about your game. And if you're not passionate about what they're passionate about, you're not going to get them. That's what it's about. It's understanding. And you only understand if you look at the data. It's not your opinion that counts. It's what they do and it's how they act. I'm uh, not sure how many of you have heard of sentiment analysis. It's uh, pretty common, but uh, how it works is a little bit complicated. So, for example, a typical um, simplified way of doing it is you'll have a lexicon. So basically a dictionary of words and they will be weighted as positive, ne uh, negative or neutral. Um, now, there's a problem with games. Let's say the word fight. Now, fight would be considered a negative word in a lot of circumstances. I fought my way through hordes of enemy. It was fantastic. Well, in that context, fight is a positive. But how do we understand that? Most of the set analysis tools aren't particularly smart, although we are seeing a huge improvement in AI-based tools. Um, so we have to be very careful. But games lexicons at the moment are still, I think, very limited. They're not as strong as they need to be. Um, but that's something that I think is going to constantly evolve. Why do we care? Well, I want to know, are people generally positive? I want to understand at the level of an event I've just done. Let's say I've just had let's say our, our new online card game, which we're launching shortly, uh, Facebook. We do a launch of Dawn of the Drakarith. I want to know, how do people react to Dawn of the Drakarith? Do they like the language? Do they like the lore? Does it affect the way they play? How do they talk about the cards that come up in play? And being able to look at the sentiment of the players through the social platforms, through the in-game messaging, allows me to have a better understanding of what's going on. 
and yes it can be applied to surveys as well so you can do survey players but to remember what i said about surveys people will often say things that are different from what they do as long as we understand that what we can find that qualitative information the the softer information that we get through surveys allows us to get under the why it's to understand the kind of identity of, of the the problem whereas um, when you look at quantitative data when we look at actual numbers all we see is that the thing happened um, so yes game lexicon can be a bit problematic moving on um, I talked about net promoter score so this is going a little bit further into the softer uh, qualitative data this is as I say where we 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 use a third-party platform in this case we tend to use antidote for PC although I think they can do mobile as well and we tend to use playtest cloud for mobile uh, these are third-party companies the third-party companies allow us to un understand you know basically recruit a small number of people six eight maybe less uh, and see what they do as they play now the important thing here is that if we recruit them directly it's going to abnormally affect the results there is an inherent bias if somebody is asked by you directly to test something if there is a third party in between that reduces that level of bias and again being able to construct a survey that is intelligent so that it understands what's going on and doesn't le provide leading questions open questions but allows you to get an understanding of what's going on can be really useful so you know what is the one thing that you would change about the first time user experience what is the one thing that you would change about xyz um so there's a whole bunch of things around that um on top of that you want to think about um making sure that there is there's a mechanism in there where you always ask the following three questions i'm, I'm going to come back to m7's um question in a second about sentiment analysis so, so when you're doing a, a, a net promoter score the key fundamental here is you want to ask these following three questions did you enjoy the game now if you ask someone did they enjoy the game they are going to lie and they're going to say yes because they don't want to hurt your feelings um, or they'll say no because they want you to get you know hard feedback because there's all sorts of motivated reasoning behind how they're going to answer that question some people may be honest but it is less likely if you then follow with the second question would you play it again again you're going to get a level of bias but that level of bias is reduced because that player has the get out that they've already answered the previous question with the motivated reasoning so the motivated reasoning is diminished one more time and then the third question would you recommend to a friend now this is the perfect moment where it isn't about them it's about the friend so again they're offsetting their personal um uh need to communicate with you in a positive way or a negative way and now they're thinking in an abstract way about what that friend would want and therefore they're more likely to give an honest answer so that third answer is really critical and we tend to use it flat straight so seven and a half out of ten thank you very much great we'll work with that technically however a net promoter score is actually a le relatively sophisticated analysis it's typically when you're doing massive surveys of thousands hundreds of thousands of people and you need to be able to separate out the lowest from the highest and then look at the average of those which would promote you know would recommend to a friend um again it's it's a complicated equation but for, for simplicity's sake we tend to use seven and a half out of ten as our target and so we'll ask people to score out of 10 each of those values hopefully that makes sense about net promoter score i'm going to quickly go back and talk about the sentiment analysis question which uh, seven asked me so how does it work with slang uh, that appears organically again this is a, a very legitimate problem there are lots of slang words which are added to the lexicons um and intent in you know insider jokes are also very complicated increasingly people are using machine learning to understand patterns to be able to filter out the signal from the noise of those idioms that are used by players um so um whilst there are there are off-the-shelf tools which do that 
Um, I can't name them off the top of my head. I probably should be able to. But it's definitely something where you want lots of, like you've highlighted it, lots of quality data where you can, um, in fact, I'm going to, what I mean by what I was going to go into is not, I got distracted by the quality of data word, I get excited about that word. What you want to do is get a lot of um, information about how players are talking in your game. So think about the tone of voice in a first person shooter versus Animal Crossing. The lexicon for you doing an analysis of Animal Crossing is going to be very different from the lexicon of, of Quake particularly quake in the early era um the kind of language the elite speak we used during uh the quake net uh, era was quite derogatory um uh, in modern parlance uh even though it was intended to be teenage kind of provoking language it was camaraderie bravado but underlying it unfortunately was a lot of misogyny and, and uh, unfortunate uh, intent um, so we don't want to um, delve too far into that, but we have to be aware of the kinds of language each game have and how we understand where toxicity occurs, where sentiment, positive sentiment occurs, and like you say, where um, we have various um, conflicts of interest. Where it is not a Latin language, where it's a different language, again, that lexicon has to be specific to the localised language. So again, it's a very difficult thing to do. There are some simplified mechanisms that people try, but it is a very, very tricky thing to get right. Um, so would gathering soft quantitative data as part of the gameplay loop make sense? Absolutely. Um, the difficulty is how do you make sure that you don't interrupt the flow? So as long as the flow is consistent, and in, in fact, you could argue that uh, Little Big Planet did this uh, because they had a tagging system that was built into each of the the UGC levels, and that tagging system was used to be able to rate and find games. Interesting. When I was at PlayStation, we talked a lot about this with the team at Media Molecule, and one thing that they decided is to no no longer do the five star rating system. So when they went from a little bit like one to two, they removed the five stars and they put thumbs up, thumbs down because they found that basically people like either went zero or five stars and therefore there was no point in having an intermediate. There were also some ways that they looked at how to do tagging and I think they, they didn't really find a good answer for how to make the tagging system work. But I think the principle between uh, giving people three tags to pick from a thumbs up and thumbs down uh, is a good smart way to allow people to feedback on levels and actions pretty well and if you can feed that into your analysis of the game that's pretty solid so uh hopefully that answers the question um well the two questions moving on life cycle analysis now there's a couple of different ways of doing life cycle analysis um i mean even if it's just looking at base retention data uh, obviously you can look at retention over time for the user lifetime but also you can look at retention over the product life's lifestyle uh, lifetime now this is one of the key um factors behind why we're such fans of live ops games live ops games are evolving continuously predictably and that consistent predictability allows us to extend the product life cycle and also when we look at the player life cycle we see that it goes through different stages for me i've identified a while back that there's a discovery stage where players find that they want to play your game or not there's a learning stage and during that learning stage it's not just about whether the players learn the controls and whether they like the story it's also where they work out where the game fits into their daily routine and too many developers forget that actually it's not just about how good your game is it's how it fits into the player's daily lifetime lifestyle um also you, have, you can look at this in terms of like longer term retention um tracks um you can graph it you can there's a one particular factor um some people call it resurrection um basically you can often find that players will come and play your game for periods of time will stop and then a period of time later they will return and then they will have a second uh life stage so how you understand how that like that additional life stage fits into the longer term retention is really key and often those players who come back later you know time and time again 
are often some of the biggest spenders over their lifetime. Um, again, we see a, a direct relationship between revenue and the long-term engagement of the player. But that's pretty obvious. I mean, you'd expect that, wouldn't you? So understanding the life cycle of your player really matters. So we've got a lot of stuff we're trying to do with our data, gameplay data. So this is more the hard quantitative stuff. So what events happen in your game? What's triggering? So level start, level ends, um, player death, you know, player kill, you know, um, object discovered. There's a whole bunch of things that we can track. Um, and we need to work out what matters, what's important. Now, you can't just capture every single piece of information. It gets very heavy and messy. And also the frequency in which you capture that data um, affects the network connectivity potentially. It affects the risk of um, you know, server uh, costs as well. So managing and um, packaging your, your analytics so that you can offset the rate in which it's sent to a server the work rate in which you, you know, can track that it's accurate and it's from a, a legitimate source. All those things are really important technical parts of the solution. Um, so understanding the detail of what happens in a session matters, but this is where we have to pay attention. GDPR matters. Um, you know, the age appropriate design code, which I'm going to talk about in a bit, matter. There's a whole bunch of issues about making sure that we are respectful, appropriately respectful of what players privacy should be we don't need to know how they you know what they ate for breakfast we don't need to know that what we need to know is what can make the game better for them and we need to make sure that players trust us and the way that we handle that data because it's actually in their interest that we make a better game because that's what they want we can't make a better game if we don't have the data um, and uh, M7 has asked, with regard to my previous um, section where I was talking about life cycle, he says, do you need to commit to a single lifestyle? So no, um, as I was saying, in the learning stage, uh, the lifestyle impact on the player uh, has, a, has a factor. Typically, we would identify three or more personas and they would potentially each have a different lifestyle fit. What we will find, though, is that there will be a, a factor about how players generally play the game. So, for example, on a mobile game, we're typically going to have, say, 90 seconds maximum play before we need an opportunity to break out. We may carry on playing. We may carry on playing for an hour. But if we don't have that 90-second opportunity to break out, the burden of play becomes too much for a circumstance where I might be interrupted. So if I'm going to play on the toilet, if I'm going to play on the bus, if I'm going to play while I'm waiting for a phone call, that won't work for me because I need to be interruptible. However, if I'm on a PC or a console, I'm in a dedicated room, a dedicated space with this enormous setup with amazing audio, visual effects because I've got an enormous TV or whatever it might be, that I'm going to be sitting down and indulging. I'm going to have a dedicated period of time, two to four, maybe six hours of play. That's a whole evening you know, of that's what I do. That's a different lifestyle fit. And the frequency someone comes into that will be different. Um, so it's it's understanding what your game suits and how that affects how players will choose to adopt it. Anyway, back to gameplay data. Actually, this is important because this will help you understand what other lifestyle fits for your game. How does your game play? How does it work for people with different lifestyles? Well, we'll understand that by looking at the demographics of the players who play and working out how we do that. Well. Um, so obviously there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes into that. Let's let's talk a little bit about filters. So um, obviously we want to be able to understand this stuff. We want to be able to filter things. So if we can build cohorts, that means groups of players. So they might be based on the source of the attribution. It might be based on the spend that they have, the level of retention they have. If we get information from the, the attrib attribution server where we can assess their likely age or um, social demographic, uh, disposable income, things like that. What their other interests are. For example, if we've done a recruitment on a bunch of people and we've said they have to like these games, well, that's an information that we'll have that we've got from our paid acquisition process. So bringing that information in is really helpful because we can create cohorts where we can understand what groups of people with similar characteristics do. And again, that can be really powerful, but we do have to care about the privacy and I will talk about how we can do that 
later. So moving on. Um, so oh, oh, sorry, just to carry on this. So tracking the player journey through the experience really matters. So we like looking at the first time user experience. So that means think about the tutorial. I want to know each of the step in the tutorial. I want to know who drops out and when. If people are dropping out too early, they aren't coming back. If they're not coming back, we've just lost a huge potential audience. And also, we want to be able to work out where in the flow people are having problems. Often we find the biggest problem of first day one retention is that the either the tutorial is too long, too complicated, too hard, too fixed, too rigid. Basically, if we can not have a tutorial at all, that'd be amazing. But of course, if you don't have a tutorial, people don't know how to play the game and they don't know what's expected of them. So there's always this, this challenge of getting that balance right. We also need to know that once they've done the tutorial, that they are desiring to carry on playing. And if you haven't set up the expectation of delight from getting deep into the game, if you don't foreshadow the value of that play, you're not gonna, it's not going to succeed. More, more than that, even further than that, if you don't show them what they should expect in the longer term, if they don't foreshadow the future value of playing, that will also affect their first time user experience and that will also affect your day one retention so it's important to, it's vital to understand what players actually do and how to be able to understand how you can have the best effect on increasing their enjoyment in that first experience but first time user experience is just one funnel i also like to look at second time user experience what does that mean that means i've done the first time user experience i'm coming back the next day what steps am I doing? How do I make sure that that journey is as seamless and joyful as the first time user experience was, but without all of the baggage? How do you get me into the thing that matters so I'm into that flow state as quickly as possible, enjoying that gameplay? So understanding the second time user experience is just as important, in my opinion, as the first time user experience. But there's another type of funnel I'm also interested in, uh, and that is the lapsed time user experience. What's that? Well, the last time you experience is those players who quit like three months ago and came back to play again, who have the, done the first time user experience point. They don't want to do the first time user experience again, but they need to. How quickly can they pick up the controls again? Anyone who's played Breath of the Wild will know what I mean if you've stopped playing and gone back three months later, as I have on many occasions. I have to restart from scratch because there is no way. I can relearn the tools. It's impossible. Well, it's possible for me. So I basically am unable to um, replay uh, Breath of the Wild. Despite the fact that I appreciate it. it's a beautiful game. I will never finish it. I just can't. I'm physically unable to because I can't remember the controls. Um, there's others as well. So what about their journey to their first time they watch an ad? What about the journey the first time they spend? What about the second or third time they spend? What about when we get to the point where they want to engage in VIP? So, you know, uh, offerings. There's a whole bunch of areas about that that matter. Um, the is asking here, when making cohorts and groups, should I steer players that are 80% plus into their desired group? Um, i.e. those that play three levels, um, watch cutscenes, stay longer, um, et cetera, et cetera. Well, essentially what you need to do is realise that you're looking at an average. Actually, I don't think it's helpful to look at an individual. I think that's going to distract you. I think there's a massive opportunity in averages. So you want very clear distinctions between each cohort. For example, retained more than seven days or retain between 7 and 14 days. That's actually two very, very different cohorts because the average engagement of a player that's 7 plus will include people who are 30 plus, 60 plus, 90 plus. A day 7 to 14 will only include those people who churned at day 14 and or have only got to the stage where they are currently up to day 14. And so their average behaviour will be very different. So understanding how you filter, what you're filtering and the implication it has can be really important. Personally, I like to know um, groups like uh, the top 
25% or quartile, as we like to call it, of spenders. Uh, the top 50, 50 to 25. So if you do like break down all spenders into quartiles, top 25, then uh, the 25 below that, the 50% and below to 25, and then the, just up to 25% spenders, that will give you some really useful information. I also like to have a fifth quartile in that context, which is the people who've never spent. So yes, I know I'm cheating a bit, but in the use of the word quartile. But the aim is to understand these clear distinctions and then look at the average behaviour between them. So I like to take that and I might want to say, for those who quit by this date. So I can understand, of those who spent no money that quit by day seven versus those that had spent no money and quit between day seven and day 14. By understanding the differences in behaviours for all of those pieces, I will hopefully be able to identify patterns of behaviour that allow me to be more effective in how I deal with the audience. Does that make sense? Um, if someone's asking here, the, uh, the plan is to push the average to behave more like most successful. No, 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 it's not to push their behaviour. I mean, you may end up pushing their behaviour. It's to understand their behaviour. Data only tells us what people did. The mistake people make quite often, I think, is that we assume the data will tell us what they're going to do. And it won't. It will give us an indication. It will give us a good bet. But it will never tell us what they will do. When we add a new factor, a nudge, for example, we hypothesise the effect that nudge will have but we only know if it worked when we look back at the data and this is another reason why we're going to talk about rate of change later rate of change is the thing that matters not nudging people into a particular position or not in my opinion again feel free to argue with me this is uh, you know one of the joys of this space is that it's all down to us understanding how we get best knowledge between us so the other form of data we need to bear attention to is obviously revenue. We like revenue. Uh, can we have money, please? Good. Like like money. Um, obviously, every app store, every platform, every ad network has its own revenue model, tools, dashboards, etc., etc. And understanding where revenue is coming from, what is selling and when and how is incredibly important. Uh, I think it's also important to reconcile that against gameplay behavioral data. So I think it's important to track purchase behavior but again we're going to get really really stuck if we are not careful because we have to make sure that we can make make sure any personal purchase behavior cannot be reverse engineered back to identify that person that is critically important i want to understand what behaviors in play trigger a purchase if i go too far with that and i try to work out which purchase by which players I can get unstuck very, very quickly. So that's where we talk about the ICO. Now, the ICO is the UK's Information Commission Office Children's Code. Well, I ICO is Information Commission Office. The Children's Code is the age-appropriate design code, which is intended to protect children in the way data is used. And games are one of the key areas that they are paying attention to. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, the team at the ICO are really good and we're very happy with the way that they've interacted with the games industry. Michael in particular, who we work with, is fantastic. Uh, and it just We're very lucky to have some sane people in that space because we could easily have gone down the road of cookies where we, I think we're less safe as a, as a society because of the way the cookie regulations have been implemented. Uh, similarly, I'm worried about the UK's... Um, online safety bill i can i i'm i'm very nervous about the way they're they're looking to do that i worry that that's going to cause problems but with the information commission office and the way they've implemented the children's code i'm very happy because they actually reached out to industry they talked to people they got people like ourselves to provide ideas about how we can produce best practice and so um the important thing here about the age uh, information commission office it's basically gdpr but with a couple of extra pieces to it the liability, if you break this, is £17.5 million pounds or 4% of global turnover, whichever is largest. Now, that's obviously for the most serious breaches, and no one has been prosecuted for that at this point in time, that I'm aware of at least, um, and they are not hunting to punish game developers. What they understand is that 
we have to do best practice and show due diligence in the way we run and capture our data. So what I'm going to try and do is talk to you a little bit about that. First thing you need to do is make sure you build a data model. This is the example we built for the Information Commission Office. We were specifically tasked with creating how would you set up a data model for a game that targets eight-year-olds. Now, obviously, if you're targeting a game with eight-year-olds and you want to have a monetizable experience and you're choosing to use ads, you're going to have to be extremely careful. That's why this um, section was chosen. And you'll notice we're using Super Awesome here because Super Awesome is a specifically um, child-friendly ad network owned by Epic, as, it, as I understand it. So we looked at how the game was discovered. We looked at where the ad mediation was. We looked at where the social feeds exist. We looked at what data exists on what piece. We looked at how the game was distributed, what, how it was hosted, what data, if any, was mapped onto where. And again, we made sure that there was no attributable personal information in any of those stages. We looked at the client. We looked at how that was operating. Uh, we looked at the server side and how that was functioning. We looked at how... Um, the link between the game analytics and the uh, and the uh, app store, particularly around anonymous session ID. We'll talk a bit more about that later. And we looked about how the ad network worked. So we had a thorough analysis of what was happening with a particular game. Um, now, we did this in graphical form. The other mechanism is called a data uh, protection impact analysis, a DPIA. You are required by law, if you're going to sell your game to UK players, to do a data protection impact analysis. If you fail to do so, you could be potentially at risk for those fines. So it's worth being very careful about that. By the way, I'm not a lawyer. Don't take my advice. Read that up for yourselves. Uh, but obviously, I, I would err on the side of caution. Um, so model how you store, where you store, what data is stored, not just by yourselves but by the third parties you work with. And by work with, the end you use, the hosting server, the back-end data platform you're using, any analytics platform you're using, any ad network you're using. Most of these teams are going to be independently compliant. As long as you comply with their guidelines and how to use them, you should be fine. Uh, I can see I'm typing away, but I'm going to uh, move on to the next slide. Um, so... How do we do that? There is one key rule. When you're creating telemetry in your game, make sure you completely and utterly separate account data from telemetry data. What that, what that means is you're going to have a player account. It's inevitable. They're probably going to use anonymous um, store ID provided by the store or your third-party backend platform. So, for example, if you look at PlayFab, there's a particular... There's an image somewhere I can dig out. I haven't put it in, in the slide deck, but it basically shows how they pass to you an anonymous store ID, so you never have the store data. Um, you know, and that's the important thing is um, you you don't need to know someone's credit card detail if you're going through a third party store. That is the best defense you have. But I would still separate your anonymous store ID from your anonymous session ID. So I would have a session ID, so a brand new randomized GUID, so uh, you know, uh, standard format uh, alphanumerical code, to ensure that the telemetry data for a specific session is tied to that ID. Uh, but it is not, it is independent of what's in the account data, which has the anonymous store ID. Along with the anonymous store ID, I would create um, any information that you have about that player, for example, did they come through Facebook? Uh, what inventory items do they own? Uh, any kind of purchasing records? Anything you need for the operation of that account. It's perfectly legitimate to have information required for the operation of that account in their account data. The important thing is that you don't put that data in the telemetry. Instead, you can create a cohort ID. That cohort ID can have, this is one of the thousands of players who came from Meta. This is one of the thousands of players who've made a purchase ever. This is the number of days since they first installed the game. That means that when you then run your telemetry data, your telemetry has anonymous session ID. And you know for that, 
that particular anonymous user that they are part of a cohort, that, that they have had the game installed for a certain number of days, and this is the session, number of sessions they've had this day. If the player says, delete all my data, you delete their account data, your telemetry remains intact. It's entirely useful. If you do it, so you have to take out and unpick all of their account data from your telemetry information, you've now in a massive problem. Because none of your data is going to hold up or be consistent. You will only have information, assuming you can unpick it at all, which you must by the, the law anyway. But assuming that you can unpick it, you could have done untold damage the way that you've collected that information. So it is legitimate for you to operate the game to capture anonymized, truly anonymized data. But you have to make sure it cannot be reverse engineered. <coughs> Just a little hint. There are some platforms out there which are acting completely appropriately. But if you're not careful and you copy all of the data that the server platform captures and store it independently, you could potentially reverse engineer individuals. So don't do that. Make sure when you're pulling your telemetry data into your analytics, you're only pulling together the telemetry data massively massively important so it must never be possible to reverse engineer i'll give you some examples so when i when i trigger an event let's say it might be game start okay so game start will be will we have a build id it will have anonymous session id how do we um you know derive the cohort data well we look at the that player's account data and then the the, the game will then post essentially parameter one parameter two parameter three of their cohort they came from this source they are a spender uh, they've been uh, playing for this number of days, that kind of information. Um, there will be a game state. So are they a new player? Or have they done the tutorial? In fact, actually, tutorial complete or not might be a cohort piece of information because it's useful. In fact, one thing you'll notice, a lot of the parameters I do for different events will have the same information. I'll have the anonymous session ID in every event. I will have the um, cohort data in every event. I have the date time XYZ stamps in every possible event. I will have the particular game states in every possible event. Why would I do that? Because I want to create funnels. Because I need to be able to compare in ways that I might not have thought of when I first set up the data. So if you can identify the game state, the activity, the cohort information, and then you can post multiple events which match the flow of your game, then you can start mapping out these funnels that say, OK, so tutorial level one. How do I know it's tutorial level one? Well, because the event trigger was game started. The game state was tutorial level one. I don't need to have multiple game starts. Because I can have tutorial level one, tutorial level two, tutorial level three, tutorial level four as game state parameters. So smarter use of the way we structure these strings will allow us to be smarter in the way we can understand gameplay behavior and make it easier for us to match that gameplay behavior against the other data that we're collecting whether it's attribution, whether it's social media, whether it's whatever else. Again, let's make sure that event data structure is completely anonymized. Does that? All, I know this is quite complicated. I'm putting it in a simple slide, but if anyone has any questions on that, please feel free to ask. To me, this is the simplest way I, I've, I've found to try and explain it. But it's often useful to go back and look at your play and think about it from a user journey point of view. If anyone's done user journeys before, they're really powerful. You have an actor who is acting, usually the player. You have what they see, what they do, what's the result. And often I'll have dependencies and I'll also have, you know, what else is happening in the back end. So these strings allow me to then work out what is the data I can measure. And actually, when we're uh, working on development, not very often anymore because we're publishing now, but when we have done development, we will often say, what is the KPI we're measuring to show that this is functioning? So that gives you full circle because it gives you what you need to test as well. So hopefully I've given you a sense of like what structure to use. 
The next question is, do we do this ourselves? Do we use a third party? Now, there's kind of two layers here. You've got tools like PlayFab, like Game Analytics, like Firebase. These provide frameworks, either back end as a service or even um, software as a service platforms, um, which hopefully make it easier for you to work out how to set up and manage your, your data. Um, there are some problems. If you can't get raw data, it's much harder to work. So I tend not to use Game Analytics at the moment personally. Uh, because you, although you can get raw data, I haven't had much luck um, making it work. It is possible to do. It's just that we haven't had much luck with the way that the developers we were working with have worked. Uh, we're working with Firebase. We've had some issues with Firebase as well, where to get output from Firebase on certain pieces of information, for example, if you're using Firebase to do A-B testing, it doesn't include all of the required information about the A-B test settings in the output because you've got four separate output feeds in a particular game we're working on and there's no cross-referencing remember what i said about cross-referencing we want event triggers to have lots of the same data in it so we can do that cross-referencing uh play fab we've had the most success with we can output to an azure or a aws um um i forgot the name of the buckets but s3 um buckets or the azure buckets and therefore you can just get the data and then you run it through something like power bi or tableau we tend to use Power BI um, just because of a historic uh, client, which we, we have to use it anyway, so we might as well. Power BI does not have the same level of consumer support as Tableau does. Tableau has a huge community of people who really know how to use it and get the best out of it. It's also prettier. So if you had to choose between the two, I would tend to suggest Tableau. However, Power BI is super powerful. You can use Excel, but don't because it will break your heart in so many places and so many pieces. Um, raw data is massive, massively important for me. I think some people can get away without that. But again, it's about a matter of opinion. Um, you are going to have to use scripting. You're going to use probably something like Python. There are other, other uh, analytics specific uh, languages you can use as well. Uh, I'm not a coder. I have a data analyst who's, who does all that work for me. But you'll need to essentially take your output, raw data output, and uh, wrestle it into shape so that you can create the graphs that you want. That's, again, why I like to have raw data, because when I come down to getting a report out, an understanding of what's going on in the game is going to require me to finagle the data to an extent where I can actually present it the way I need. And obviously, if we do that well, <coughs> we can set up dashboards. <coughs> dashboards mean that we can go this is what's going on this is how it's happening this is the pattern we can see at a glance what's going on for that game creating a dashboard is relatively straightforward in something like power bi or something like uh, tableau incredibly powerful tools like game analytics tools like um um playfab do have actually playfab less so but tools like game analytics and um the such like do provide you with dashboards and they're okay. Adjust is another example of a, of a platform that does a really good job. Um, they're great, but they're expensive. Um, but they, they sometimes are limited because they may not give you the data you want to understand your game. And so you will have to think about how that do it yourself dashboards. You can present it the way you want. You just create these little widgets on the screen so you can see what's happening, when and why. So the next thing, um, I mean, we're near the end. Um, what is success? Now, you need to work out what success factors are for you. I can tell you what you know typical games are. So if I can get a sub pound CPI, if I can get a sub 50 cent um, CPC, I'm happy. Uh, if I can get day one of 40%, and this is PC and mobile, um, day three of 20% and day seven of 10%, I am delighted. I'm ecstatic. Sorry, I'll rephrase it. Day 1 of 40, day 7 of 20, day 30 of 10. That's what it should be. Um, but every game has its different pattern. It's probably more typical in a mobile game to see something like 35% day 1, 15% day 7, 7-8% 7 day 30 as a successful game. On PC, you might see something like 35% uh, day 1, 10% uh, day 7, 10% day 30. Because they might have, once you get people past a certain point, they have more of a, some people call it a terminal velocity, so a consistent engagement. Um, you will know for your game, you will only know by looking at other sources. You can use things like Steam Data Suite, sorry, not Steam Data Suite, Steam Spy and Steam DB, 
will provide you with data on other games uh, for PC. Uh, data AI, uh, reflections and so on and so forth will give you an assessment for mobile games. Actually, at the moment, there's a problem. We can't currently get at a reasonable price um, estimated downloads and installs um, that none of the platforms are currently offering it to indies, which is a shame. Game uh, analytics have started with their game Intel site. Unfortunately, you can only get total data. You can't get data over time. It's good, but not great. Um, so, you know, there, there's a lot, lo there's some value in looking at those third party platforms to get an estimation. But the bottom line is you need to talk to other developers, listen at conferences to work out what numbers are good. But you also need to work backwards from your own models, your own business models, your forecasts, whether you're hitting your targets. So actually the reality is the specific fixed number is not success. What matters is the rate of change. Oops, that took a bit longer, I think. What matters is the rate of change. So all of the KPIs you're looking at, you want to see how much you can consistently maintain them, how quickly you can grow them to a maintainable state. And when they start to decline, how you can intervene to fix that decline or decide that the game has reached the end of its life cycle. Now, when you reach the end of the life cycle, I don't mean that's the end here, if you've got a product, that will often be where you start engaging with product management, for example, sales, pricing, etc. on Steam. But again, we're looking at rate of change. What's the level of engagement and how we offset you know, the decline to make sure we maintain the impact of the game over the longer period of time. I think we're there. Uh, so we've talked a lot about uh, different forms of data. We've talked about the importance of privacy, and being able to structure your data in a way that's sensible. Hopefully I've given you an insight to think about how you can use that data to have understanding of what it means for your player and how you can then improve the experience of your player playing those games. But does anyone have any questions or thoughts? I'm going to take a chance to sip my cup of coffee. So I can see M7's typing away. Always rely on him to uh, come up with great questions. Um, again, if anyone else wants to type away in the webinar and AMA discussion channel, please feel free to do so. In fact, I'm going to move on to this. Um, again, like I say, we're uh, a, a living game publisher, which hopefully most of you know already. Um, if you want to find out um, more, obviously you're, you're in the Discord, so you can come and join us and talk about anything to do with games you like. We actually... Um, starting to look at how we can improve the way that we engage in this space, trying to make it a bit more busy. Um, you'll also find there's a whole bunch of resources that we have on our website. If you look at uh, fundamentally games um, slash um, knowledge dash base, uh, there's a whole bunch of webinars and, uh, and articles. Uh, this webinar recording will go up on there, but I will obviously send it out uh, to those people who signed up on Eventbrite. Um, and so you'll get that as well. Um, and so on and so forth. Um, and obviously, if you have other people you think should pay attention to this stuff, or you think we should go into more detail, um, the important thing is we have an AMA session on Friday between 1 and 3 UK time, and I'm literally happy to sit on uh, uh, Discord and just chat away with people about what's going on and what questions. It can even be about how glorious my hat is. Uh, S7 is saying here, how much should I rely on sales knowledge or sales vector to do initial structure or framework for retention and data analysis? Um, so basically, I personally uh, think that anything you do in advance, sales knowledge and so on and so forth, will be wrong. But that's okay. Knowing it's going to be wrong means you're treating it as a hypothesis. So again, we're using the scientific method. We create a hypothesis. Now, importantly, you need to make a guess. For these KPIs, you need to state what you expect to see before you get the data. If you don't say what you expect to see before the game, you get the data, when you get the data, you will find all sorts of reasons to justify why it's great or terrible, depending on what mood you're in. We need to take away the, uh, the sentiment, the personal feeling about what's going on in your game. You need to make it so you're focused on being successful. And that means looking at the, making a hypothesis, testing it, and then looking at why that result happened. We can do that by using quantitative 
and qualitative data. Quantitative makes, you know, I look through the funnels, I play around with the filters, I create the different cohorts to understand what's going on. I'm doing the same process, whether I'm doing that for my attribution data to work out how I can be better at marketing my game. When I'm looking at the social metrics, again, how I can make a better community for my game. And also how I can do it in terms of gameplay. So looking at the behavioral data to improve the way. By connecting the dots between all of those pieces, we're going to have more success than if we try and do them each individually. Does that make sense? Um, something that apparently wasn't answered. I'm trying to work out what that was. Uh, so just trying to work out what the one that wasn't answered. Oh, uh, for those who know nothing about data store stuff, who should I seek to do it? Um, so, uh, data store stuff. I'm not too sure what the, what that means. Um, Yeah, I'm not entirely sure what the question is asking. Sorry. I... So when you're looking at um, the store information, the anonymous store ID, I think you might, were referring to. Um, so the, the anonymous store ID um, is... So when you, when you sell something on a store, you're going to be setting up a stock keeping unit on that store. Uh, stock keeping unit, SKU. Uh, is an identifier that's on the store that has an inventory kind of reference in the game. And so you need to have a connection between the store and the game. So when a purchase happens, some sort of ticket code key, um, obviously a Steam key, for example, is transferred from the store to the game and assigned to that user. And so their account data will have an inventory item added to them. But that process is done using an anonymous store ID and therefore you don't need to worry about it basically. Um, if you are making your own store and you're using say a third party, um, uh, I can't remember the name of the companies now, but there's a whole bunch of, um, like Exola for example, uh, as a third party store, um, you are dealing with that account. Now I believe it's worth checking out how Exola handle it. Exola might act as the store of record. If they do, then they will have the privacy data for the player, not you. But I don't know that's the case. If you are provided with the credit card details of the player at any point, that is personally identifiable information, PID. Personal identifiable information is the bit we need to be careful of because as a mobile, you know, Android, iOS or Steam or Epic Store um, developer, we never touch the payment process. That should all be fine. Does that make sense? Um, so, yeah, that uh, there are people you could potentially go to in terms of um, GDPR and others. It's generally a lawyer. Um, there are agencies out there. Personally, I think um, lawyers are probably worth uh, engaging at some point. There are some basic principles, however. So if you do a data protection impact analysis, if you do a review, for example, if you have a publisher, they will generally be required to do that review. So we do a DPIA analysis with all the games as we go into a day 14 or day 30 test. That means we look at what data is there, how it's run, and so on and so forth. When we're talking about a, a up to day seven, we don't tend to worry so much because the level of data we capture is almost you know, irrelevant and we will wipe it if any player has any issues. Um, but, but we do still check it. We do still check there's nothing personal. We do still check the account data is separate from the telemetry data. <coughs> so we don't take any risks. But that's really the, the, cru the crux of it. Um, if you look at the Information Commission Office, uh, you'll need to register as a um, data manager, I think is the term. Somebody might remind me. Uh, there are probably equivalents in, in other territories as well of that. Um, and uh, basically, you need to check that. Again, if, if in doubt, 
don't trust uh, a consultant sitting on a, on a screen. Go talk to a lawyer. But we can give you some kind of general principles. Uh, anyone else got any questions? I can see Alex and M7 chatting and typing away. No worries, no worries. Oh, no worries, Alex. Um, glad you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much all. That's all, folks, exactly. Uh, thank you all for participating. Any, if you liked it, please let us know when we post it out to YouTube. Obviously, like, share, etc., etc. Uh, if you didn't like it, tell us because we want to improve them. Uh, and obviously, we'd be really, really appreciate any feedback you guys have on the process. If you're around on Friday and you want to sit, spend a couple of hours chatting about data, games, favorite thing you're playing, my my choice in hats, whatever you like, I'll be available for an AMA then as well. So thank you all for participating. Uh, that's all folks and uh, hopefully speak to you all soon thanks guys